Thanks very much, Mr. Yang. Like I said, uh, we will go to questions in just a moment. Uh, so please, when the microphone gets to you, state your name and your news affiliation. We're going to kick it off. Um, you identified the problem very clearly. You offered some solutions, but one solution I don't hear is what are those truck drivers going to do after they lose their jobs and get their $12,000 a year? We're looking at a multi-year transition. Let's call it um, five to ten years before they experience significant displacement from self-driving trucks on the highways. Some context, only 13% of truckers are unionized, so this is not a grand negotiation. 87% mom and pop, uh, small business owners, many of them took out hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans to buy their, their truck. After I'm president in 2021, there'll be very, very clear messaging to let truckers know. It's like, look, uh, many of you are going to lose your jobs in the days ahead. Because this transition is so significant, I would appoint a trucker transition czar to take some of the $168 billion a year and uh, take some of those resources and try and create a runway for many of the truckers. But on the individual trucker level, Let's say you have five or six years before the robot truck uh, eats into your hours. You're getting $12,000 a year. You may save, let's call half of that. So maybe you'll have like thirty, forty thousand dollars uh, in savings. And then you lose your job. You're getting another $12,000 a year. And you go home to a town. Let's call it a town in Missouri. Let's say that town has 10,000 adults in it. With a freedom dividend, there's another $10 million a month in that town. So what does that mean? That means that the Main Street businesses uh, are expanding instead of shrinking. That means that local nonprofits have much more in the way of resources. It means there are more opportunities at every sta every uh, access point in the local economy. So instead of an existential threat where uh, you might resort to something very, very dark, um, you're going to go home and say, okay, this is a very, very big change in my life, but I have tens of thousands in savings. I'm going back to a town that has some opportunities for me instead of going to a town where there's nothing and feeling like uh, you're not going to be able to meet next month's rent. Okay, and then before we go, I'm going to uh, do... And, and to the extent that retraining programs work, uh, we should be using them, but the reality is they'll work for approximately 20% uh, of the truckers involved. And I've been to truck stops in, o in Ohio and Iowa and around the country, and the reality is if you were to show a set of truckers like a clipboard and say, hey, would you like to sign up for a retraining program, uh, you would not get many takers, let's put it that way. There's not like a whole like great deal of enthusiasm and excitement to uh, to get retrained for a, a different field or livelihood. Uh, just one more. This is a little self-serving for those of us in the room. Um, journalism has also suffered a huge amount of job losses, and you have some interesting ideas related to journalism, including creating a billion-dollar fund to make grants to nonprofits and local governments for local news. Yep. Uh, of the American Journalism Fellows. Yep. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why, why you see a role for, in your campaign for supporting journalism? If you believe in democracy, you have to believe in journalism, particularly at the local level. Over 1,200 local newspapers have gone out of business in the last number of years, and we all know why. They used to have classified ads and revenue from those ads. And now those ads went to the cloud and Craigslist, and they didn't have a new source of revenue to replace it. Studies have shown that if you lose your local newspaper, voting becomes more polarized, because you don't know what's going on in your town anymore, and so you just vote along party lines. And then you have lower levels of government accountability as a result. So if you're going to believe in democracy, particularly at a local level, then you need to support local journalism. And this, in many ways, is a microcosm of what's happening in our society writ large, where we just listen to the market and say the market can do no wrong. So if the market says local newspapers should not exist, then local newspapers shouldn't exist. Um, but that's not the way our society should function. If we say, look, we're a democracy, and you need informed voters at a local level to have a functioning democracy, then we should find a way to support local journalism. So that is why I proposed a local journalism fund that would help create cooperative ownership business models, and in some cases, uh, partner with ph philanthropy to help create sustainable models of journalism in communities around the country. And one source of uh, 
strength in many of these communities is the public library. Our trust in libraries and librarians is actually higher than our trust in just about any other institution. And many libraries already have a community bulletin board where it talks about what's going on locally. So if you can build on some of those existing resources, you can actually create many, many thriving local papers, you know, papers used broadly because they might not actually be papers. Uh, you can create a lot of local journalism um, that would stand the test of time. The problem right now is that if you're a newspaper, it's not enough for you to break even. You have to make enough money to keep your shareholders happy, and in some cases, those shareholders are private equity firms and hedge funders that bought your paper and then consolidated them. But if you go to a community and say, look, this paper is never going to become like a huge money maker, but it can pay for itself, it can break even, then you can actually recreate local journalism in many, many communities. And that's where we should be investing. We should be investing public resources to help make that happen. We have to treat journalism like a valued profession and hand in hand with a functioning democracy. And saying to you all, and you all work for fancy news organizations, so it's probably, you're not, but even you've seen this, like you have young people approaching you and saying, hey, I want to go into journalism, and then what do you say? <laughs> right. Like, you know, I have many friends who are journalists and many, many friends who are aspiring journalists. And I think it's a tragedy what's happened to journalism around the country. A generation ago. It's like now it's like, oh, how did that piece perform? How many clicks did it get? And then the natural incentives are for you to become a little bit more aggressive. Sensationalist with like the headline or the angle. Uh, and that's just the way the industry is unfolding because the almighty market uh, is pulling all the strings. So if, if you want to change that in communities, you have to actually put some public resources to work. Sorry, that's a bit long winded, but I'm very passionate about it. You all do great work. We need to make it so you can do your jobs without fearing uh, getting fired the next day because your stuff didn't get enough traffic. How do you prevent political interference if it's, if it's uh, supported by tax? Well, you're, you're literally looking at matching funds in many cases. So if you're, let's say, this billion dollar public fund, you're, you're just waiting for the entity in Chattanooga to come and say, hey, like we have this plan. Um, we have $50,000 together, we're looking for another $50,000 to, to match. And so there's not much political interference to be had, you're just buttressing and boosting local efforts. It's that or just let local, local journalism die, I mean, uh, like, which I don't think anyone's in favor of. Hey, Mr. Yang, hi, Bob Wiener, Wiener Public News Op-Eds with young journalists, several are here today. You say that automation is costing manufacturing job loss. Senator Warren says no, it's bad trade deals. Isn't it both? And what's your view of trade deals like NAFTA? Any economist who lo who's looked at this has said, yes, it's both. Uh, and, and then the question is, what is the mix? What is the proportion? Most of the studies I've seen put the uh, main cause as automation to the tune of 70 to 85 percent of lost manufacturing jobs. So you can find different analyses that have different proportions, but most everything I've seen has the vast majority of those manufacturing jobs being lost to automation. Nick Farizos, Um I've noticed that there's a change in the conversation about money and politics based around your campaign, and not just you know small dollar donations, not just grassroots support, but also things about money as a force for good. Uh, you know, a lot of times we think about Citizens United when we think about money and politics and the negative aspects of that. How is your campaign changing the conversation about money and politics potentially as a positive thing if you believe that? And secondly. How do you think at the core of it, your ideology around money and capitalism differs from maybe some of your opponents like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren? I like that question a lot. Most of us agree that at this point, money and corporate money has overrun our political system. And so most people are looking for a way to solve for that, including overturning Citizens United, which the people in this room know overturning Citizens United would actually be quite difficult. You need a, a supermajority, a very high standard. The other thing, as I said in uh, an earlier debate, is that no matter what rule you put in, 
uh, corporate money will still have outsized influence. The fact is, before the Citizens United ruling, corporate money had outsized influence, and then the Citizens United ruling sort of spurred that. And so the question is, how do you counter a system that has been held captive by lobbyists and corporate money? And the answer is that we need a new source of money that's tied to our people. And so I proposed 100 democracy dollars for every citizen every year that's use it or lose it, and you can give to any political candidate uh, or campaign. And this would wash out the lobbyist cash by a factor of eight to one. It would change the incentives for every political figure. Because I've been running for president long enough to know that there's, uh, unfortunately, a massive gulf between the people and the money, where you can get a bunch of voters behind you, and then the sources of money are over here waving their, their stacks of like hundreds or thousand dollar bills. And as a politician, you start responding to the money more and more because it's easier to count, and the food is better, um, and you 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 know you can measure it more directly. Uh, and people tell you to be smart, so you should go to where the money is. Um, so the only way we can solve for this problem is to unify the people and the money and make it so that if I get 10,000 voters behind me and they all give me their democracy dollars, that's a million dollars. And then when the lobbyist starts waving $100,000 in my face, I can say I'd, take the, I'd rather get the million dollars from the people. Uh, so there is, I think, a, a, an approach right now uh, among political candidates that everything is a rules problem. It's like, oh, what's that? Money is overrun our politics, we need new rules. Um, it's not so much a rules problem as it is a power problem. And what we have to do is we have to, have to remedy the imbalance of power to actually benefit our people as opposed to the, those it currently benefits. Sorry, the second question about the difference between your views on capitalism and, and, and money as a whole, as a force for good in society, compared to maybe someone like Bernie Sanders, you are, especially through UBI, handing people money and letting them choose the, the, you know, how they use that money. Some would argue that you know, others are doing the reverse, where they're saying, here are the things we're going to offer you. What is the difference you know, about that, that worldview? Um, I think most Americans instinctively realize that $1,000 a month in their hands uh, would be a very positive thing. Uh, and I know this because I've been giving families around the country $1,000 a month for months now. Turns out it's a lot of fun, uh, and uh, for uh, all of them, it's not about the money, it's about uh, their humanity and values. So an example, Kyle Christensen uh, lives in Iowa Falls with his mom who's recovering from cancer. Been giving him the Freedom Dividend for months, and the last time I saw him, he seemed like a new man. And he said to me that he'd spent some of the money on a guitar and was playing shows for the first time in years. Uh, he was beaming when he told me this. So for Kyle, it was a new guitar. For Jody Fassi in New Hampshire, it was car repairs. For Mallory Shannon in Florida, it was going back to school. This is what the money means in our hands. It means different things uh, according to who we are. And this is a way we can positively transform Americans' lives for the better in a way that's fair that we can all agree on. I'll let um, you call on people. Hi, I'm Marissa Schultz, New York Post. Thanks for being here. Hi, Marissa. Hi. Sorry. Found you. Um, I have a question for you regarding education. Based on your background at Manhattan Prep and also based on your education platform on your, for your campaign, um, one of the things that caught my eye is you were talking about expanding selective schools, such as the elite public schools in New York City. Um, as you know, there's high stakes admissions tests to get into these schools. And I'm curious with your background at Manhattan Prep, where you stand on this, um, there's controversy in New York City currently that um, these schools may have uh, discriminated against black students and, and Hispanic students, and there's been this increase in Asian American students at these elite public schools. Do you believe that these high stakes admissions tests are inherently discriminatory, and also I want to see where you stand just more generally on testing in K through 12 schools. Is there enough, or should there be more currently? Or is there too much? Into the third choice. Correct. <laughs> if, if I didn't say that, that's what yeah. I meant. <laughs> we came up with uh, the SAT during World War II as a means to figure out which kids that we did not want to send to the front lines. 
And somehow now in America, every year is wartime, where we use the SAT as this bludgeon on many of our young people that ends up uh, altering their hopes and ambitions in fundamental ways. I believe that we overemphasize standardized tests at every level in the United States right now, uh, and that uh, it's doing our kids harm. Uh, as someone who spent some time in the testing industry and was quite good at the tests, uh, they tend to measure your family's resources and your test taking ability more than any other human quality, uh, including intellect more broadly defined and character and human worth. And we pretend that they measure all these things when they, in fact, do not. So we should de-emphasize these tests at every level, give teachers the ability to actually do their jobs, because right now teachers in classrooms around the country are doing things that they know are not the best for their classrooms or their kids because they feel they need to teach the test because they know that's the way they're going to be evaluated at the end of the year. Uh, and we need to have more holistic means of, uh, of evaluating kids uh, than this one-size-fits-all testing regime. One of my boys is on the autism spectrum, uh, and in my view, being neurologically atypical is the new normal in American life, but our schools don't reflect that at all, that if you show up to most any public school in this country, it does not have the expertise or resources to have any sort of individualized treatment of uh, a child who's neurologically atypical, like my son, uh, and that is the direction we need to go in the 21st century as quickly as possible. The fact is we're uh, preparing our kids for an economy that no longer exists. Um, that's the way the SAT is designed. That's the way most of our public schools are designed. And the, the fact is there's not a real incentive among schools to change that dramatically because uh, they will continue to, uh, to open year after year um, even as the economy has changed around us. Over here, if you can wait for the microphone. I'm really liking these questions. This is so fun. I should pretend to be one of those figures from like, just be like, you know, like, like I pretend I know who you are and that we have a relationship and then, uh, <laughs> and then I, I'll like, like pointedly ignore this one person who like wrote a nasty story about my administration. <laughs> no? <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> well, Mr. Yang, I hope you like mine. Uh, I'm James Wright with the Washington Informer newspaper, and I just want to know what are your thoughts on D.C. statehood? Do you support Washington, D.C. becoming a state, and why? And if you don't, why not? I do support statehood for Washington, D.C. Uh, to me, it's long overdue. I mean, uh, this is a fun, fun fact, but it's true. This is actually a debate topic I, I argued um, when I was a teenager. <laughs> and the, the fact that it still has not happened since I was in high school, uh, to me, just shows how dramatically overdue it is. Uh, but we all remember the cry, no taxation without representation. Uh, and last I checked, the folks in DC are paying taxes, and so they should be represented. Thank you. Uh, my name uh, is. I'm Mizu. sorry. I'm also for uh, statehood for Puerto Rico as well. I, I, I genuinely think a lot of this is that we're just fixated on the number 50. We just need to break that seal, and then after that, uh, you know, we'll see just how uh, overdue statehood is for DC and Puerto Rico, among others. Hi. Um, my name is Mizumi Dutcher from Fuji Television, Japanese TV station. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I have a question about foreign policy regarding Asia. Uh, next month, the military information sharing agreement between Japan and Korea, both allies of U.S., uh, will be revoked. And from the perspective of the U.S. security guarantee uh, in Asia, how would you respond to this situation? Thank you. Excuse me for a sec. Uh, my sister-in-law and niece are in Korea right now, um, so this is something that I, I, I find personal. I mean, uh, we have security guarantees for a reason, and one of the tragedies of the Trump administration is that people don't view American commitments as rock solid, um, whereas they should be viewed as rock solid. In many cases, they've stood the test of time for decades. 
and we should not be making moves that call those commitments into question. I haven't met my niece yet because she's quite young and I'm running for president and, <laughs> and uh, hi, um, Korea at the moment. Sorry. Hi, uh, this is Lionel Donovan with the uh, TRT World. Um, speaking of America's commitments to allies abroad, um, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on the situation that's taking place in Syria right now and um, what would be your thoughts in regards to um, dealing with uh, President Erdogan? This is another American tragedy, completely avoidable, where Trump abruptly pulling troops out of Syria has been uh, disaster for our Kurdish allies and many people in the region. Uh, the challenge is when you come into power and you see the situation on the ground, uh, you can't reverse the mistakes of an earlier regime and so you have to try and make the best out of the reality that currently exists. So that would be my approach. Uh, I will say that I've signed a pledge to end their forever wars. I do not think it's appropriate for the United States to be in indefinite uh, states of conflict for years and even decades uh, well past any original congressional authorization, which is the way it's designed in the Constitution. Uh, but uh, the goal would be to try and stabilize the region and uh, work multilaterally uh, to do so. Hi, Mr. Yan. My name is uh, Chen, and I'm with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. My question is also about foreign policy. Would you mind just commenting more on that? You have mentioned there will be a, there should be a rebalance between U.S.-China relations. But would you mind just commenting more on how would you tackle this issue and deal with, especially the trade war right now? Thank you. The U.S.-China relationship to me is one of the most important relationships that's going to define the 21st century. There are real trade issues, uh, particularly the piracy of our intellectual property um, on the part of Chinese firms. Uh, but to me, the trade war was a, and is a counterproductive way to try and approach those imbalances because it ends up creating victims uh, that have nothing to do with the, the conflict, including producers and farmers in Iowa and other Midwestern states. Now, the Chinese government has two main priorities that unfortunately sometimes right now are, are at odds even with each other. Number one is maintaining robust economic growth so that they can continue to try and uh, raise their standard of living. And number two is maintaining social order. Uh, now, the United States has an incredible influence on the first of those two goals because we are one, uh, one of the main drivers behind their continued economic growth. And so the goal has to be to use both carrots and sticks to improve the relationship, address American concerns, with the big picture uh, stance that the U.S. and China uh, are going to be the two biggest economies in the world for quite some time, and we need to work together on things like climate change, artificial intelligence, uh, and geopolitical hotspots like North Korea, and that if you don't maintain any degree of cooperative relationship, then those problems are just going to uh, get worse over time. It's not an easy relationship to manage because we have many genuine tensions and uh, difficulties, but it's an important relationship, maybe the most important relationship, and that's the way we should approach it. Hi, um, I'm Emma Kennery. I am with Bloomberg News. I have two questions for you. My first one is, uh, this morning we had a story come out about um, Pete Buttigieg taking advice from Mark Zuckerberg on hiring. I was wondering if you would take advice from him, why or why not? And um, I was also wondering, if robots are taking up so much of our jobs, why isn't the measure of economic production higher? I'll take the second first for fun. Um, so if you look at the manufacturing, numbers, I believe our output has doubled while employment has declined. So uh, our productivity has increased a ton in the most automation intensive fields. Uh, the way I understand the Mark Zuckerberg, Pete Buttigieg uh, communication was that there are folks who worked at Facebook that wanted an intro uh, to the Buttigieg campaign and, um, and then Mark provided. Um, I don't know Mark. Um, and so it would be very odd for him to send an email to me to say, like, hey, <laughs> I really want to work for you because I'd be like, 
well, um, you know, uh, but I think most people, if they got that kind of email from Mark Zuckerberg, uh, would take a long look at whoever he was sending along because the executives he was sending along are probably very um, good at their jobs uh, and would have a lot of relevant expertise. Uh, but I don't know Mark, so it would be kind of strange for him to uh, introduce someone to me. <laughs> Uh, David Smith of The Guardian. I'm um, just going back to your... Ex hey, David. Uh, hi, how are you? <laughs> this. Um, just, my, my dreams are coming true. <laughs> <laughs> first time anyone said that to me. Um, That's uh, not true. David. Just going back to your explanation of why Donald Trump got elected. Uh, there's obviously a lot of debate still over, was it economic anxiety or was it uh, racial resentment, uh, maybe even a backlash against Barack Obama and so on? Um, for everything you said, I mean, are you firmly in the camp that economic reasons were, were more important, or, or do you think uh, race played a big part as well in the 2016 election? Well, again, if you dig into the voter district data, you see a straight line up between the adoption of industrial automation in a voting area and the movement to Trump, and that's localized. So that, to me, is a very, very compelling uh, data point. I think that uh, racial issues and economic issues are actually hand in hand. And so if you're a parent, right, if you were born in the 1940s in the United States of America, there was a 93% chance that you're going to do better than your parents socioeconomically. That's the American dream. You're going to do better than your kids. Uh, if you were born in the 1990s, that's down to 50-50. And then it's declining. So if you're a family in a part of the country and you, you have children and you look up and say, wow, I don't think my kids are going to have a better life than I did. They might have it worse. And then someone shows up on TV and says, hey, it's these people's fault. You'll be much more receptive to that argument than if you, things were going great for you and your family and you were like, oh, everything's rosy. And then it's like, blame these people. And you'd be like, blame them for what? <laughs> My life is great. So the, the fact is uh, economic anxiety and issues uh, play into racial tensions uh, in myriad ways. Certainly, I'm not someone who's unmindful of the profound role that race uh, plays in American life and American politics. Um, but to me, the economic drivers set the stage at a minimum. Uh, hi, Maria Michela D'Alessandro, The Globe Post. Uh, so again, about, hi. Hey, there you are. Um, about the freedom dividend. Uh, what if, because it's not that clear to me in your website campaign, uh, what if uh, with $1,000 most of the prices will increase, such as, let's say, rents? Such as what? Rents. Yeah, rent. Yeah. We printed $4 trillion for the banks during the bailout, and there was not meaningful inflation as a result. To the extent that there has been inflation in America, unfortunately it's been in three core areas that have made us miserable. Number one is rent, number two is education, number three is health care. Now, these three are not because of massive buying power on the part of the American people. Rent is somewhat localized. You live in DC, which is one of the most expensive areas in the country, so you're feeling this. Um, but the fact is that rent in certain me uh, metropolitan areas has gone way, way up relative to other parts of the country. And the folks who live in a place like DC have access to a different sort of e economic opportunity as a result. But also, there are all of these nimbyism and uh, zoning regs that keep affordable housing from being developed in many of these metro areas because the current property owners uh, don't want that sort of housing development near them. Education, college has gotten, uh, gotten two and a half times more expensive than when I was in school and has not gotten two and a half times better. And parents have felt like they have no choice but to pay that bill no matter what the sticker price is. And the government has made massive loans available to parents. So now we're up to $1.6 trillion in school loans as a result. And then healthcare, there's a massive private insurance industry that's between patients uh, and providers, but also opaque pricing and a principal agent problem, and every year the healthcare costs go up. So what I'm suggesting is that the inflation that exists in American life today is not a result of money supply or buying power. It's a result of certain dysfunctional marketplaces. If you look at most of the things we consume every day, let's call it food, media and entertainment, 
clothing, electronics, automobiles, these things have either gotten cheaper or better over time because th these are markets that are truly competitive and where technology has been allowed to play a role in both supply chain um, and distribution and manufacturing. So the, that's a very long-winded way of saying that if everyone gets $1,000 a month, there will still be price competition in most every industry and cost sensitivity among consumers. It's not like after you all get 1000 bucks a month and then you go to the uh, corner bakery and their muffin went up in price from like $4 to $6, you would be like, oh, I'll pay $6 for that muffin. You'd be like, wait a minute, this was $4 last week. And all it takes is one bakery to not gouge you <laughs> to, to keep all the bakeries from gouging you. So the core inflation um, in housing, education, and healthcare, I have separate plans to try and address those, but you would not see rampant price spikes in any other uh, vertical. Uh, I think we have time for one and maybe two more questions, depending on how quick this is. So right up here in front. Okay, thank you. Hi, Andrew. Good to see you again. I'm Zhang Qi with China's Taishin Media. And as you said, U.S.-China relations are the, 20, the most important relationships in 21st century. So uh, I will ask two questions on China. First on trade is U.S. and China have currently see like they have this phase one deal, which they haven't signed yet. But if you take over from here, what would you do next? And I'll leave my second question after you answer. Can you go and ask the second one? Yeah, sure. So second question on technology. Do you see China's rise in tech as a threat to the U.S.? And do you see any uh, cooperations in this area between U.S. and China that could help the people in Midwest to, uh, to deal with the transition of the economy, as you mentioned? Thanks. I think in technology, the biggest area of potential both competition and cooperation is artificial intelligence. The fact is China is set to leapfrog America in AI in the days to come if it hasn't already done so. There's a joke I'll share, because I, I, I think you'll find it funny. How far behind is China uh, in AI than America? The answer is 12 hours. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So, so that was the joke in AI, but now it's actually changed to the, the, the point where it, China may be ahead of us in AI but for two big reasons. Number one, they have more access to more data, which is like food for machine learning algorithms to make them smarter over time. And that's because there are more people, more transactions, also uh, fewer restrictions. And number two, they have higher levels of computing resources available to their biggest companies than we do because the Chinese government has essentially made tens of billions of dollars in computing infrastructure freely available to their private companies. And I have met with the richest companies in America on artificial intelligence, and they say even though they're spending billions, they are concerned about their ability to keep up with the Chinese expenditures. So these are two big reasons why China may be set to leapfrog us in artificial intelligence. They're also spurred by the fact that in many places, cash is essentially uh, not used in China. So you have more and more transactions that you can end up monitoring and making use of. And this is an area where we need to remain one of the global leaders so that we can cooperate with China to solve some of the biggest problems of our time, including things like climate change, where artificial intelligence could play a big role. So that is, and that would help people everywhere um, in the Midwest and otherwise. So that's the big challenge and opportunity ahead of us uh, in terms of technological cooperation and competition with China. As for the trade war, uh, I would have to see what the cir circumstances were precisely when I take power. Uh, but the, the goal would be to try and uh, improve the reality on the ground for American producers uh, and try and meet some of the concerns that initiated the trade war in the first place. Okay, uh, I know there are many, many more questions out there, but are you we claim are out of last time. I am going. No, I'm going to just going to take power All right. over here. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming here. And because you came here, we are going to give you the most coveted item in Washington D.C. You can drink whatever you would like out of it. Wow! Uh, so thank you, Andrew Yang. <laughs> thank you, Allison. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you. Oh yeah, do you think? The mug.